Hey folks. What better do I have to do with my time? We last left off having made our way through the Galactic HQ and now I have to become a Mountaineer. And while I do that, I also need to get Weezer's stupid ass to finally evolve. Generation 4 introduced a bunch of new evolutions for old Pokémon, and while I think that's really great in concept, the way it was implemented just feels so strange. Because right alongside these new Pokémon, they also introduced some of the wackiest ass evolution methods ever seen in the series. It seems like this was done to maintain continuity with old games where these evolutions didn't exist. For example, you could say that the reason you couldn't evolve Magmar into Magmortar in Generations 1 through 3 wasn't because Magmortar wasn't created yet, it was because there was no Magmarizer in those games. Now in theory, I think it's a nice idea to make an effort to maintain continuity as things get added and changed between games, but in practice, I think it's annoying. To my knowledge, there's no actual in-game information that tells you or even gives you any hints as to how the hell to evolve these Pokémon. Yes, you can argue that some of them are somewhat self-explanatory, but don't try to tell me that there's some obvious connection between the Rhino and the outline of a house. Not only that, but they just feel really inaccessible in a lot of cases. For example, Weezer needs to level up at night while holding the Razor Claw to evolve, and where is the first place in the game that I can get a Razor Claw? A hidden item in the Galactic HQ. There's hardly even hidden items in buildings in general, let alone buildings that are meant to be staging grounds for the story. If I didn't know from looking it up beforehand that it was there, I would have never thought to whip out the dowsing machine in the middle of a critical story segment. And if I didn't do that, the next place I'd be able to get a Razor Claw is in Victory Road at the end of the damn game. And this is probably one of the less egregious cases, because at least you don't get Sneasel until pretty late in the game to begin with. But take Glaceon, for example. You can get one by leveling up an Eevee by this icy rock right before the seventh gym. The only place to get an Eevee is from this one NPC right before the third gym. So you have to either A, keep the Eevee on your team throughout most of the main adventure to make sure it stays leveled up, which is going to be really annoying because Eevee is dog shit in battle, or B, leave the Eevee in your box and put it on your team when you can actually evolve it. And now you have a level 20 Glaceon that you need to waste hours of your life grinding up because most Pokémon you battle are level 40 at this point. So basically, if you want to have a Glaceon on your team in the main adventure... No you fucking don't. Look, for the most part, obtaining these new evolutions isn't that bad if you know what you're doing, but I just think it's so bizarre how they're actually handled in the game. Like, were they just counting on us to have Bulbapedia on standby? I just feel like they should have made them a little less convoluted to obtain so that more players would be able to appreciate them. Well, at the very least, I'll be able to appreciate Weezer's evolution pretty soon because here we begin the trek through Mount Cornet. This has to be one of my favorite segments in the entire game. It's just so perfectly atmospheric, the harsh, intense weather on the outside and the empty darkness of the caves on the inside delivers such a strong sense of isolation. And the act of scaling a mountain while fighting through galactic grunt battles contributes a heavy sense of challenge and danger. And it's true to the situation in the story, you really are going it alone to confront a dangerous enemy, and the setting just fits it so well. The music adds so much to it too, it gives you this feeling of rising tension and fear while simultaneously giving a feeling of contemplation, like you're looking back on something from the past and pondering life. And I think that really fits this moment in the story, this Team Galactic confrontation really is the culmination of everything you've done on your adventure up to this point, so the combination of tension and contemplation works really well. I enjoy a lot of video game music, and it's always vitally important for setting the mood, but I don't think any song I've ever heard sells the atmosphere quite like the Mount Cornet music. This whole segment is just masterfully done, it's just so compelling on a raw, emotional level, which makes it so memorable and so enjoyable to play through. And yeah, Weezer finally evolves into Weavile here. It's always a nice feeling to get that much closer to finally rounding out your team with fully evolved Pokémon. And especially with it happening during a pivotal story segment, it really adds to that feeling of, man, look how far I've come. Anyway, we eventually make it all the way to the top and reach the Spear Pillar, which is another one of my favorite places in the game. Much like Mount Coronet proper, it has such a compelling visual design and a great music track that makes it feel so intense and climactic. And I think this big final confrontation with Team Galactic is orchestrated pretty well and really ties together with the atmosphere of the area. It starts off with a double battle with Jupiter and Mars, where our rival rushes in at the last second to save the day. I really like this moment, because your rival at the end of the day is your friend, and getting to fight alongside someone whom you've interacted with so much throughout the story and who had previously always been your opponent... I don't know, it's just... nice. And it's made all the better by the fact that this moment is told through the gameplay itself, rather than just through dialogue, by actually fighting a battle alongside your rival rather than just... 
I don't know, he just shows up and gives you something or say, battles one of the commanders for you so you only have to fight one or something, you actually really feel like your rival is helping you, the player, because you can see it happening with your own eyes. I just think there's something kind of sentimental about this moment, which makes this segment of the story more fun and more memorable. Except right after the battle, he just heals your party and runs away, so I don't really know what his deal is. Anyway, after your rival leaves, Cyrus prepares to birth a new world with the power of his red chain, or excuse me, two red chains, one made with organs and one made with... cloned organs. Then cue this absolutely whack-ass cutscene and... <laughs> Wait guys, <laughs> watch this. <laughs> so, Cyrus summons Dialga and Palkia, the legendary Pokémon of time and space, and for some reason his text boxes are weird, which just makes the Lake Guardians fucking pissed! They have regrown their organs and are now here to save the day, but unfortunately their power isn't enough to stop the combined power of both Dialga and Palkia. WHAT THE HELL IS THAT?! A mysterious shadowy Pokémon appears out of the ground, jump scares us, and creates this wormhole looking thing. Cynthia finally shows up and tells us of a myth she uncovered of a legendary Pokémon that comes from another world. Oh, you think? And thus we commence arguably the most unique and memorable area of this entire game. The Distortion World. The Distortion World is really Pokémon Platinum's flagship location. It's the only fully new area introduced in this game that wasn't in Diamond and Pearl, and there really isn't anything like it in any other Pokémon game before or after Platinum. Like, are you seeing this shit? There's wacky floating platforms you have to jump between, platforms that move around in all directions, platforms and obstacles that appear and disappear, you get to walk on walls at 90 degree angles and surf downwards on an upward facing waterfall. Without the waterfall HM. And all the while, everything is tied together by the constant sightings of the mysterious shadow Pokémon, the eerie, foreboding background music, and an infinite, spiraling, dark void. It's just so utterly surreal, and truly one of the most creative locations in the series by far. Now, as for what you actually do in here? Well, you do what everyone does when they're in the void. Solve puzzles. You have to push these strength boulders around into the pits that the late Guardian legendaries indicate. It's kinda random, but it is still a pretty neat puzzle, making you have to think about how to navigate the boulders and yourself through multiple layers of wacky terrain. Soon enough after doing that, we go with Cynthia deeper down into the world to meet Cyrus for one final battle. This is one of my favorite battles in the entire game, because Cyrus finally has an actual team! He now has five fully evolved Pokémon, and they're all actually pretty tough to beat. Like Christ, how'd you one-shot Falco with a flamethrower? This battle was so tough for me as a kid, and thus left a pretty lasting impression on me, and it was still a legitimate challenge this time around, even with all my Pokémon experience and a pretty well-rounded team. The Pokémon of his that gave me the most trouble as a kid by far was his Gyarados, and this time... It still lived up to the hype. This thing was a bitch to take down! I had to sack my entire team to stall it out with healing items and paralysis RNG. Because I am a skilled player who knows how to win in a fair fight. At any rate, I was eventually able to beat it and have Pingu land the finishing blow on his Crobat to finally win the battle. I don't know if it's just a me thing, but during major battles in Pokémon games, I usually try to make it so my starter is the one to defeat the boss's final Pokémon. I don't know, I just think there's something sort of poetic about it. Like, yeah, you are the OG and you're gonna be the one to end this. Another thing I like to do is try to have every member of my party participate in the battle, preferably with each one defeating one of the opponent's Pokémon. It wasn't exactly one-to-one -one in this battle, but every member of my party did make an appearance and contributed in some way to ultimately winning. I think that just speaks to the magic of Pokémon, the fact that I feel such an attachment to these virtual creatures that I'll go out of my way to make sure they all get a chance in the spotlight just shows that the games are pretty damn good at making the player feel a genuine bond with their Pokémon. Or I'm just a fucking weirdo. So, with Cyrus defeated, there remains only one thing left to do. Battle Giratina. When I first played through this game, I opted to use the Master Ball right away. It's clean and efficient, and I think it is somewhat fitting to use the Master Ball on the game's main legendary. But this time around, I decided to try and capture it through conventional means. I just really enjoy the challenge of trying to capture legendaries that way, and to be honest, I'll always have that part of my brain that's like, well, what if I need the Master Ball later? I could catch every damn Pokémon in the game and I'd still be like, well, what if the Among Us character actually is in this game? At any rate, I eventually capture Giratina and name it... Giratina. Has anyone noticed that every Pokémon's name is capitalized in this game? Cynthia and I have one final interaction with Cyrus where he rages at his failure to make the world without spirit that he so desired, and we emerge triumphant in the send-off spring. I really like this place, it's just so peaceful and upbeat, which is a refreshing and frankly rewarding change of atmosphere after a pretty tense segment of the story. But it also brings back some bad memories. 
That's right, story time is back! So when I first played through this game, I found a wild bee barrel in this area and it had this weird sparkle animation play when it appeared. I had a feeling it was something kind of special, so I tried to catch it, but after a few balls, it just refused to get caught, so I gave up and ran from it. All these years later, I now realize that that was a shiny Pokémon, which are extremely rare and generally incredibly exciting to encounter whether you're hunting for one or just playing the game casually. Although I had a feeling that that bee barrel was unique somehow, it didn't seem quite unique enough for me to spend a bunch of time and effort trying to catch it, because it wasn't really clear what the sparkle animation meant, and so I didn't really understand how it was unique. So yes, like an idiot, I willingly ran from a shiny Pokémon. Well, maybe if they made it look any different from a normal bee barrel, we wouldn't be having this conversation! Fuck. You. I don't understand these shiny Pokémon that barely look any different from the normal version of that Pokémon. The whole point of Shinies is to be a wacky, alternate color palette version of a Pokémon to provide you with something a little more unique. It adds to the variety of Pokémon games by being such a rare event, as it makes for an exciting moment that'll always stick out in your memories of your experience with the game. But then some of these Pokémon just got the shortest possible end of the stick. Like, wow, I wonder what my Gibby would look like if he were shiny. Well, yippee ki -yay. At any rate, we head back to Sand Gem Town at Cynthia's urging, and finally reunite with Professor Rowan and Dawn. It's a fun little full circle moment, after all you've done in your adventure, returning to the place where it all began and thinking about how far you've come since you last visited, it's nice. And it's here that Professor Rowan gives us one final mission. Get our final gym badge at the Sunny Shore City Gym, and beat the Pokémon League. And so we have our work cut out for us. We're nearing the end, and although I hate to end on a cliffhanger, well, we can't always get what we want. Like, for example, you might want a shiny Pokémon that looks remotely different from its normal form, but sometimes some people have other plans! 